Hello everyone, Dr. Jacob Wilson here. Hey, listen, it's great to be back. Um, we're, we're, we haven't gone live in a long time, um, but um, we've been super busy here in the laboratory here at ASPI. Um, actually, Charlie, uh, um, who, who I'm gonna be bringing in, Dr. Ottinger now, he actually finished a really big study um, on offset loading recently. If you don't know what offset loading is, I'm actually gonna probably call him up later to explain what that is, but it's a really unique, innovative training technique. We've been looking at all sorts of ingredients, doing research on things like ketones, ketogenic dieting, um, and uh, some new supplements, some new ingredients that are uh, pretty novel. The purpose of today, everybody, is we're gonna answer your questions. And I think every Wednesday at around one o'clock, we're gonna come answer your questions live. Um, a lot of you sent our, your questions before, many of you posted them um, over the last two days. We're gonna get to those. And then as you have questions that are live, we're gonna get to those as well. But again, make sure every Wednesday around one o'clock, you keep coming back, because we're gonna be answering your questions live at that time. So with that being said, we're gonna jump right into the questions um, that you've already sent us. And if, if some that are interesting comes up, uh, Charlie's gonna pop them over to me as well. Um, I'll give my insight, sometimes Charlie's gonna give his insight, and that's, that'll be the format. So again, super excited to see you, let's roll. Sweet, all right, first question we have, somebody said they've been trying to lose weight for a long time. They initially dropped about 20 pounds, but their progress has stalled. How can they keep going and what do you think is happening? So that, listen, one of the biggest things that happen in, in life is that um, is we plateau. It's called the biological law of accommodation, right? If we keep doing the same thing, generally speaking, we will adapt to it and stop responding. So you started dieting, you lost 20 pounds, and you've hit a plateau, right? How many of you guys have hit a plateau before? Pretty much everybody, like 100%, okay, have hit plateaus. So you need to take a step back and understand what's happening. One, your body, it's adapting. And how can it adapt? Several ways. Number one, it becomes more efficient, um, potentially at storing the calories that you're giving. Two, it could, it could potentially lower your metabolism. Um, uh, three, you could lose some muscle on part of that 20 pounds, which will lower your metabolism, right? A large majority of the calories you expend are from the muscle um, that you have. So you could lose muscle, you could be more efficient at, at storing calories. You could be less efficient at burning off excess calories. You could be more efficient at the exercises that you're performing. There are many different things. So what we want to do kind of is I like to say when someone's, first off, congratulations on 20 pounds, but what you probably want to do is hit the reset button, okay? And adapt to something different. So we're going to focus on is re-raising that metabolism and then when we go back to, uh, and when you re-raise it, so we're gonna re-raise our metabolism and focus on body recomposition for about four to six weeks. Then we're gonna go back into main focus of fat burning and use some new tools. So how do I re-raise my metabolism? Number one, if you're in a, you're in a somewhat of a calorie deficit, you wanna go back up to calorie maintenance. So um, it, you know, if a deficit, maybe you're 250 to 500 calories down, you might wanna re-raise your calories up by maybe about 250 a day. Um, be careful, maybe 100, 250 a day, maybe to 500 a day. Now, how do I re-raise my calories and not gain fat? Raise those calories almost primarily by protein. Studies show that you raise calories by protein, it elevates your metabolic rate, but you don't, um, you're not going to gain fat. So you raise your protein, it's gonna raise your metabolic rate, but you're not gonna gain fat, and your body's gonna go, hey, um, I'm okay, I have excess calories, I don't have to store. So that's what you're gonna do the next four to, four to six weeks. Now, <clears throat> on top of that, what you're going to do is what you're gonna plan for coming out of that four or six weeks to lose more fat. How do we do that without plateauing? Number one, you're gonna calorie cycle, okay? So um, basically what I suggest on a calorie cycle is you have um, uh, two low calorie days, one moderate, um, um, uh, one moderate calorie reduction day, and then um, uh, a moderate day and a high day. Or actually one thing that's worked for me is maybe you have two calorie deficit days, one maintenance day, one slightly above maintenance. So two 
uh, deficit days, one maintenance, one slightly above maintenance. That's how you're gonna calorie cycle. Studies show that avoids plateaus. Two, um, uh, you're also going to try different techniques. Like for example, you might throw in intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is a great way to calorie cycle. So let's say on your two low calorie days, maybe you're intermittent fasting uh, 18 hours. Then on your maintenance day, maybe you're only intermittent fasting 12 hours. And then on your normal day, you're not intermittent fasting at all, okay? That's something that you can throw in. The third thing you're gonna do besides calorie cycling is I want you to change your exercises up. One of the reasons why we stop losing fat is we adapt to the exercises. Studies show that. So let's say, for example, um, Charlie is a big guy, okay? Um, and he has started running, okay? At first, when he started running, it was like, damn, this is awful. Um, and, uh, but as you if, say that Charlie runs every day, pretty soon he's going to get in a stride. He's not going to be as, he won't feel as fatigued, okay? And when he becomes efficient is when he's going to stop burning fat. Okay, same thing with you. Whatever cardio you're doing, whatever weightlifting you're doing, you become more efficient at and you stop burning fat. Switch up your exercise selection and switch up your cardio selection. When you do that, that's gonna send you into a burst of fat metabolism. Now, you might be tempted to go into that right away. I don't suggest that. Four to six weeks of body recomp, up your calories 25500, and then switch over um, to the fat loss I just talked about. All right. Next question, can you really target the biceps peak? So I think one of the, listen, when you think about bicep peak, what do you, who are the guys you think about? Obviously you think about guys like Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time. He had these huge mountainous peaks, right? Um, and people are always like, how do I get my bicep to peak higher? I can remember when I was in school, there was this massive debate where people just said, oh, muscle's very simple. You just have origin to insertion and any exercise is the same as any exercise, right? Um, now, I will tell you that that's a, uh, that's a overly simplistic me me mechanical model that um, I think works in for general conception, but not for bodybuilding. It's fall I would say it's been shown false. So basically, there's two ways you can get at the, at the biceps peak, which is kind of, which is your long head, okay? Or the lateral head of the biceps. One way is you can put the muscle on stretch. When the muscle's on stretch, it tends to activate that long head more. So what, are, what activities are that? Uh, that would be, for example, things like um, incline curls are gonna put the, the biceps on stretch. Um, you know, or if I'm doing cable curls, if I have the cable behind me and it's dragging my arms backward and I'm curling, that might put the biceps on stretch. Anything that puts the biceps on stretch might target the long head more. The second thing is to kind of understand the anatomy of the musculature. You have the triceps, you have the biceps, and kind of wedged in between, you have the brachialis. And the brachialis is a muscle that, um, if you look at people flexing from the side, on the side it gives you that 3D look, okay? And so the brachialis is in between, okay, the biceps and the triceps, but it makes up a large portion of the arm. Now, what ends up happening is um, when you look at your, your, at the wrist, you look at your hands, when I turn my hands upward, that's called supination. When I put it down, it's called pronation, okay? Supination, if I'm stretched and I'm supinating, that's gonna activate the biceps really well. But if you look at the attachment point on the biceps, you know, on the radius, um, basically the forearm bone. When I twist my hand to a neutral position or a pronated position, mechanically it kind of puts the biceps in more of a disadvantage, okay? So if I make my arm neutral or if I make it pronated, meaning palm downward, now the biceps um, are at a disadvantage. When they're disadvantaged, the brachialis actually has a, is going to um, be more useful so to speak, right? More of the load will fall on the brachialis. So if I train the brachialis with a neutral grip, hammer curls, pronated grip, reverse curls, um, when I'm doing that, you're gonna overload the brachialis more and that muscle will grow and it will push up on the biceps 
and make the peak of the biceps look greater. So any, any movement that's stretching, neutral hammer grips, pronated movements, we don't spend a lot of time doing pronated movements, reverse curls. We don't spend a lot of time doing um, neutral hammer curls. If you do, that will help the bicep peak. Is lifting weights dangerous for old people? Okay, so, so listen, is lifting weights uh, um, um, dangerous for old people? You know, I remember when I was, um, I went to graduate school and um, my professor, her name was Dr. Patton and she worked with old people. And I remember um, all I was interested at the time was just research for bodybuilding. I walked in there and I had one mindset and that's like, hey, what can you do to make people enormous as possible and as shredded as possible? So you can imagine she's doing research and, um, and older people. And I said, so she's like, she wanted me to come help her do research. You don't really have a choice when you're in grad school. You kind of do what you're told. But she wanted me to do research on, on uh, elderly people. And I said, so, so you want me to help you with this research project with old people? And she, man, she basically slapped my, I mean, physically slapped my hand. And she said, Jacob, they're elderly, okay? So uh, from then on, I've referred to older people as elderly, okay? So, um, and I can remember that hand slap, like the back, you know, it was like it was yesterday. And I remember we ended, we ended up going and doing research all day. And I was like, I wasn't interested in it at all at the time. And the more I've uh, gotten older, Besides that, um, uh, besides that, you know, with my parents and um, grandparents, and um, you start to become more interested in like, hey, bodybuilding is not just body. Bodybuilding can be something across lifespan, right? So I'm going to flip that question. I'm going to what I'm going to say is that I think it is dangerous for elderly people not to lift weights. That's my honest opinion. Um, what is one of the number one ways that elderly people die? They fracture their hip. When you fracture your hip, some studies show that within 15 months, there's, a, there's an, up to an 80% death rate after fracturing a hip. Why is that? Because you're not strong. After the age of 50, we lose 1% of our muscle per year, on average after the age of 50, and that accelerates actually more like when you're in your 70s. So you, you are sitting there and I am telling you, after the age of 50, you have a shovel in your hand and you're digging one step closer to the grave every year because your strength's going down and your power's going down. You are going to fall, you're going to fracture a hip. It is dangerous not to lift weights. Beyond that, my dissertation was actually looking at changes in age-related muscle across lifespan. And what I am going to tell you right now is we looked at people all the way up into their 80s. People in their 80s can gain muscle. Okay, so instead of losing a percent muscle per year, you can uh, actually gain a percent muscle per year. And in essence, you are reversing the aging process. So if you want to get younger, say, say, for example, if you're talking about either yourself or your grandparents or your parents, if you want your grandparents and your parents to become frail and to break, don't lift weights. If you want them to um, uh, gain muscle, um, anti-age, be independent, not have to be on tons of medications, not have to be in a nursing home, not have to um, um, hate their life and be depressed, not have to um, have almost no confidence in walking and instead of have to shuffle everywhere that they go, um, not be able to play with their grandchildren, um, instead be miserable the rest of their life, don't have your elderly lift weights. <laughs> thank like you. Thank you. It. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I was not passionate when I started in grad school. I've become passionate now. That's good. Next question. Are deadlifts bad for your back? Okay. So listen, um, I would love to answer this question. I have a lot of uh, insight into this question. However, we got another guy who's, who's also a doctor um, and who also um, was a, a professional powerlifter who's actually also who can lift really heavy weights at the same time. Um, and probably the best guy I know in the world as far as programming is concerned. Um, if you look at our Muscle PhD Academy course, um, he did an entire series of lectures just on the deadlift. Um, I think I'm gonna turn it over to this expert right now. So if you don't mind, 
Charlie, Dr. Ottinger. I'm going to have him answer this question if you don't mind. Sure thing. <clears throat> What's up, guys? I know some of us have met online or other various locations before. Um, so we're talking about deadlifts being bad for your back. And it's something that pretty much everybody has heard at some point. Don't do deadlifts. You'll hurt your back. I've worked with strength coaches in college, professional, private sports. A lot of them will always say, I don't have my athletes deadlift. I don't want them to hurt their backs. But yet they'll go do heavy squats, front squats, cleans, snatches, RDLs. They'll do everything but deadlifts. So what's the deal? Well, if you look at the research, and, and a lot of research that's looking at injuries from weightlifting, they're looking at people that are actually weightlifting. They're looking at real weightlifters, real powerlifters, and real strongmen. Deadlifts don't hurt people's backs when they know what they're doing. Those people are not hurting themselves from deadlifts. It's actually squats that are hurting their backs more. Um, weightlifters actually have the highest rate of back injuries amongst powerlifters, strongmen, and, and uh, weightlifters, and they don't even deadlift in their training, or they don't deadlift in their competition at least. So to me, that's saying the deadlift's not the problem, it's the person performing the deadlift. And moreover, it's the person teaching the deadlift. Because the one thing I've seen, at least anecdotally, a lot of people that are afraid of having their client or their athlete deadlift is they're just bad deadlifters themselves. If you yourself are a bad deadlifter, you probably suck at teaching the deadlift, and the people whom you have do the deadlift will probably suck at it too. So from a biomechanical standpoint, yes, there's a weight in front of your body. Yes, it is trying to flex your spine. The crazy thing is that the spine's okay being flexed. It's just a question as to whether or not are you strong enough to maintain that position, and are you generating that force in a controlled fashion to where your spine doesn't reach that breaking point that people talk about. So I think really it comes down to making sure your form is perfect and making sure your core is strong enough to be able to withstand that position. If you look at a lot of the best deadlifters that have ever walked this planet, every single one of them deadlifts with a rounded back. Because guess what? It effectively lengthen, lengthens your arm and reduces the range of motion of the movement. It's easier to lift with a rounded back, but you have to be able to do that. You have to prepare yourself to do that. So I think a lot of people are kind of putting the cart in front of the horse when they say, our deadlift's bad for your back. They're not. No exercise is inherently dangerous, but the way you perform exercises can be. So if you're concerned about deadlifts, make sure you have somebody who's a good deadlifter teach you how to do it, and I think you'll be fine. Do you have anything to add to that? No, no, actually, um, what are your, if you were, what are the top three things you see, Charlie, that people do wrong in the deadlift? Like yeah. That oh, yeah. I think the big thing that people do wrong to hurt themselves in a deadlift is, if you ever see somebody deadlift for the first time, they try to yank the bar off the ground. And when they yank that bar off the ground and they're not ready for it, they're not pulling with their chest up, that's what causes that spine to flex quickly under load, and a lot of times that what's, that's what causes the pain, so, or the injury, if you may. So the one thing I actually have people do when I teach someone to deadlift, I actually start them with stiff leg deadlifts. Now, sometimes I'll elevate the bar, or I'll do it off of blocks or something similar so it's not too much of a range of motion, but when you start someone with stiff leg deadlifts, you take away that tendency to yank the bar off the ground, you slow the movement down, and you can really isolate or emphasize that action of getting your hips to the bar. Because ultimately, the bar coming off the ground is just a byproduct of you getting your hips to the bar. So if you can isolate that movement to just the hips and just do a stiff leg deadlift, that's a lot easier to teach. Um, another big way I could see people getting hurt is by not getting their back tight before the lift. If you see somebody deadlift and they start pulling on the bar and the first thing that happens is that their chest folds over, they simply haven't activated or gotten their lats tight for the lift. The lats, or your upper back in general, are actually the muscles that keep the bar close to your body during the deadlift. The further that bar is away from your body, the harder it's going to be to lift, and the more risk you put your spine at. So if you get those lats tight, if you think about closing your armpits before you start to pull the bar, that bar is going to come right up with you. I think realistically, those are kind of the two main things don't try to yank the bar off the ground, stay tight the entire time, and make sure your armpits are closed throughout the lift so that the bar stays close to you. And other than that, take your time working up weights and continue to build your core, continue to build your posterior chain. I don't see any reason why you ever get hurt deadlifting. I've torn pecs, I've torn patella tendons. I, every lift I have ever done, I have hurt myself. I've torn quads multiple times. 
I've never hurt myself deadlifting. Never ever. So one last question for mm -hmm. uh, the Dr. Eidinger here. So listen, um, so do you think that deadlifts are a good live exercise? <laughs> yes. The question, if you didn't hear, is Doc asks, are deadlifts a good lat exercise? This is something you won't see research on yet because we haven't done it yet. We still need to do it. Um, I have an entire article about this on our website. Long story short, yes, deadlifts are a great lat exercise. What we just talked about, the lats and the traps are the muscles that keep that bar close to your body as you're deadlifting. If you are actively trying to do that, you're putting a ton of isometric tension on those lats. Think about flexing your biceps as hard as you can. Your lats are doing that tenfold because they have a weight against them in a deadlift, okay? And if you look at the mechanics of a deadlift, especially the first half of it, that bar is actively trying to move your arms away from your body. So if you're keeping your lats tight and fighting that resistance, you're building your lats big time. I, it, I know it's a selection bias, but I've never seen a great deadlifter with a small back. Yeah. Every, Every good deadlifter I see has a massive back, and that's because those lats and traps play a huge role in deadlifts. Awesome. Thanks, Charlie. You got I it. Appreciate it, man. Go back to Doc now. So, uh, you know, I'll tell you, um, it's great to have Charlie here. Um, he's just an amazing person and uh, really does some, one of the best writers I've seen, one of the best scholars as far as, far as um, uh, lifting, gaining muscle, gaining strength in a practical manner is concerned. Um, and I think he brings kind of the, that great element of um, old school with new school. This is just my opinion, but I think a lot of the new science, like honestly, I, I don't read many review articles because I think a lot of the new um, interpretations of data are kind of lost in translation. People get so smart that they get dumb and they forget the practical application of things. In other words, they can't move beyond what experiments have been done, whereas Charlie's able to integrate all the data with um, the practical experience. So he knows the information as a scientist, but he also knows it as a lifter. Um, and one of the things too, guys, if you are interested, Char both myself, uh, Charlie, Dr. Reidinger, and also um, uh, Dr. Ryan Lowry, we put together an academy that we'd love you to join us on, um, the Muscle PhD Academy. It's a 30-week course. Well, you would be basically be working with myself, Charlie, um, like Dr. Ryan Lowry, who's an expert in nutrition. And um, we're going to work with you as one-on-one -on -one students for 30 weeks and give you more information than you could possibly imagine. Um, you'll get more information in that 30 weeks on uh, different angles of gaining muscle, losing fat, um, succeeding in life um, than probably, I would say, a PhD in um, in in academics, and I can tell you that from personal experience. Um, Charlie can tell you that from personal experience. You, you don't learn this stuff in the classroom. So like I said, um, if you are interested in that, head over to themusclephd.com, and we'd love to have you as a, as a personal student and work with you for the next 30 weeks. So all right, what's the next question? Next question. Will lifting with the belt make my waist bigger? So I'm gonna answer this question like real straightforward, no. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I've heard that a lot, but no, lifting with a belt's not going to make your waist bigger. Um, I don't really see a, a mechanism for that. Maybe, um, no, I, I'm just going to say no, because I think it's just that straightforward. I think it's a myth. Yeah, a lot of gross science. Yeah. What happens if a woman uh, takes testosterone? Okay, what happens if a woman takes testosterone? So I think the thing to understand is... Um, Women have a lot less testosterone than men, like a lot less, you know? And, um, and I think the thing to understand is that what is testosterone? Testosterone has two properties, okay? Um, the anabolic, right, or, and it, meaning that it helps me gain muscle, and, he, and that anabolic process helps me lose fat too. There's an anabolic process, a body recomp process, and then there's what we call an androgenic. Um, anyone know what an androgenic process is? Androgenic is basically a masculine, a male uh, biological features that we have, right? So um, if you're a guy, what are things that we know? We have a deeper voice. Um, we have facial hair. We have more body hair. Um, 
uh, we might have a sharper jaw line. That's the androgenic effects of being um, a man, right? So I think if you, so what happens is if a female takes testosterone, even a small amount, and you just have to understand this is what comes with it, because um, I do know obviously it's popular in, in female bodybuilding, but you have to understand that yes, there'll be a muscular, so one, you'll gain muscle, two, you might lose fat, three, you'll get stronger. Like, oh, this is great, where'd I sign up? You also need to understand that there are androgenic effects, and the androgenic effects are, um, oftentimes aren't reversible. So um, even at small doses, you can change your voice. You might, your voice might get a little deeper and you may not be able to change that. You may sprout some hairs, you know, uh, um, on, you know, the beard area or facial area or the stash um, or even body hair. And so um, you, you might change other things as well. Um, and so those things won't get reversed. Um, and so you do need to think about that. I, there are many, um, uh, female bodybuilders who, who have come to me and said, hey, you know, I just, um, my coach said just take a little bit, just a small amount. It's just going to help you lean it, me, lean it for the contest. And I only did it for one contest, and now I, 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 my voice permanently changed. I haven't been able to change back. Th those are things you need to calculate. And I'm just I'm throwing that out there and I'm trying to be politically correct here. Those are things that you are just going to have to calculate um, when you're um, – talking about taking testosterone because these things are not fully reversible. Uh, and I'll give you an example too. Let's go the, let's take the opposite spectrum of it. Um, let's say someone's trying to um, be more feminine and they, they wanna get rid of their testosterone. So they maybe take um, things that would block testosterone or lower it. Um, the the changes that they have, and there's lots of studies in this, that gave them certain male characteristics, don't go away. I mean, they'll lessen, but they're not going to go away. So that's even like, obviously that's the opposite case, but there are certain, my point is there are certain permanent changes that do occur. Next question. I'm trying to bulk, but I want to do intermittent fasting to stay insulin sensitive. What's the best way to do this? First off, this is a great question. If you said the question, you're smart. First of all, you'd be a smart move in saying this. Um, if someone asked me the question, how do I bulk and stay insulin sensitive? My first response to them would be to intermittent fast. Now, um, there are lots of studies, and actually, it's funny, because a lot of the studies actually, original studies were in um, animals. But they'd take the animals, and they'd have them do dirty bulking. So you take these rats, and you put them on McDonald's diet a rat McDonald's diet, and then the other rats are on a clean, clean diet, and um, the rats that intermittent fasted while eating McDonald's didn't gain as much fat. Some of them didn't gain as fat at all. Now, I'm not telling you that you can go out and eat McDonald's intermittent fast and stay shredded, but what I am telling you is that it will lessen the impact. Intermittent fasting can um, make a world of difference and um, erase a lot of mistakes. However, I do think meal frequency could be important for gaining muscle at the same time, right? So what I'm going to basically suggest to you is basically um, that you uh, do, you cycle your intermittent fasting, okay? Um, one thing we know is that 20-hour intermittent fast will make it very hard to gain muscle. I don't recommend that. So your, your, your highest intermittent fast you're probably going to do is more like the 16 hour, okay? Um, so you might fast for 16 hours, you have, then you're gonna have an eight hour eating window, but you're gonna cycle that. So for example, you might have two days of 16 hours, one day of 12 hours, one day not, and then start over. That's how I'd recommend imp implementing that. I do think that meal frequency could be important. Now, if you're trying to lower meal frequency because you're more of an endomorph, um, then at least in your intermittent fast, try and get like three meals. And then um, during the fasting period, do a modified fast. I would suggest having ketones in the morning. Um, Fernando, who's filming this, for example, when he intermittent fasts, he'll have something that's like a keto, he'll have keto broth. Uh, you can look, I think it's on Amazon.com Amazon now, um, 
but prove it has a good keto broth that he has, but have ketones and then have amino acids with it in the morning. Um, that'll keep you growing or at least not losing muscle in the fasting period and then between meals have amino acids. I got one for uh, to follow up with this. Yeah. Um, to uh, shorten your fasting window, can you take like berberine? Oh, that's a good question. So, so basically to kind of uh, not have to fast as long? Correct. So if you're not doing a 16 hour, can you do uh, a shorter fast and use berberine to kind of yeah. keep going? So, so let's say that, for example, you are trying to grow and you're trying, you're trying to stay insulin sensitive and that's the purpose of intermittent fasting. What Fernando is suggesting, and I think he's right, is so fasting will kind of cause like somewhat of a, you're, you'll deplete certain things. Like you deplete carbohydrates in your liver. Um, you may deplete something, some in your muscle. And that will trigger responses that make your muscles, because there's not as much insulin around basically, there's not as much insulin around, your muscles have to get better at hearing the signal. It's kind of like um, if I'm used to being in the dark, I see better in the dark in, in a sense. Um, same thing here. Well, another thing you can do is trick your muscles to think they're low in energy, which is what a fast is somewhat doing, and they'll become more insulin sensitive. A way to do that is like what uh, Fernando's talking about is like berberine. So you might take like um, a half a gram uh, you know, and some people work their way up to 1.5 grams of berberine a day. Um, but that theoretically should allow you to maybe only fast 12 hours if you want to get a higher meal frequency. Um, I think the combination of that berberine, 500 milligrams to 1.5 grams, combined with the uh, uh, intermittent fasting will help. Now, remember, berberine will help us with insulin sensitivity during a meal. It will make you hungry. So if I were to... Man, if I were to fast and take berberine, I, I personally can't do it because I get way too hungry. But if I'm going to have my biggest meal, I take berberine before that, um, and it should help. Sweet. Next question. Do you think intra-workout nutrition is necessary? So do you think intra-workout nutrition is necessary? It depends on the workout. So, for example, um, uh, and I think uh, we've talked about this. Charlie may have written some articles about it. But um, uh, in essence, if you're talking about getting in and getting out of a workout, then having some essential amino acids before and some pre-workout, that's going to peak in 30 to 60 minutes anyway, right? Those nutrients will peak in 30 to 60 minutes. So if you're training for like 30 minutes to 45 minutes, um, it may not be as important so long as you went in nourished. I'm going to make a caveat to this. Now... Let's say you're looking at old school bodybuilding, okay? Um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Serge Nubre, um, you know, guys from the 70s, guys from the 80s. These guys would train two hours at a time. In fact, guys like Lou Ferrigno might train four to six hours at a time. Would it intra workout nutrition help for them? Absolutely. Um, back, in, back in my day, people were still doing the two hour workouts, you know? And nowadays it's like, oh no, you, once you, can't, you can't work out more than 45 minutes, okay. You know, I mean, I would beg to differ with that, but I think that, I think I will say this. I think it's a technique. I think you can get a lot done in 30 to 45 minutes in 60 minutes. Absolutely, if your intensity is high, can you maximally grow during that time? Sure. In that case, if you walk in nourish and you have something for your workout, no. If you're old school and your two hour workouts, I do think having some um, intra-workout nutrition, maybe some carbs intra-workout, um, maybe after 45, 60 minutes, having some more essential amino acids to keep the growth going, I do think it could be beneficial. Is there a time where it could help, say, um, during your workout? Um, if someone is on a very low carbohydrate diet, the one time, and, and they're doing it to be insulin sensitive or to keep insulin low, the one time that insulin will be forced to stay low is during your workout. And so that's where like a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Jordan Joy, he, I was fortunate enough for him to actually do his master's degree with me a while back. And um, we collaborated on a, a project. He did his dissertation on um, this topic. And he found that when you gave carbohydrates like either before or during exercise, even if you're keto, you didn't get knocked out of ketosis. So if you're, if you're more low-carb or in a keto, maybe having some of your carbs 
lightly during the workouts, even if they're short, um, could cause a reward in your brain. Your brain will somewhat be rewarded because you're not used to carbs. An adrenaline spike that keeps insulin low and uh, so overcome that fear of insulin. And the pumping action of your muscles will drive those carbohydrates toward the muscles, what we call contraction independent uptake of glucose. When we say independent, independent of insulin. So those are my scenarios. Here's what I think you like. My cat is getting really chunky. How can I help them? <laughs> that's a great, so that's a great question. And I think we can apply the whole question to all of our animals. Um, I think if you look at lifespan in humans, okay? If you look at lifespan in humans, it's increasing. Um, but if you look 100 years ago, man, if someone lived 50, might have been old age right 60 might have been old age why is 80 old age now in 50s we consider young really you could be just getting started a lot of it's going to be sanitation nutrition um, and uh, exercise and of course yeah medication now a lot of people have had dogs who have died when they're five six years old a lot of people who have had um, cats that die young why because you're going to the grocers, and, and, and I hear this all the time, right? Um, well, it's a dog, just feed it dog food, you know what I mean? Or it's a cat, just, it's, it's just a cat, just feed him whatever, right? Just realize that most of those foods that you're feeding would be equivalent to you eating McDonald's or Burger King, all of your meals. Now, if you did that, all of your meals, how long would you expect to live? You'd, you'd cut probably a good 30, 40 years off your life, now, you might live long because you're, um, hot, you're, you, you're taking a bunch of medications, you have a cabinet full of medications, but your health span sucks. Your health span gets to the point where if you were a cat, your owner, you know what they would end up doing. They'd probably put you down if you were a cat. Instead, you are able to take a bunch of medications and stay alive. We don't want that for our cats, we don't want that for our dogs. My response to you is, what do you do for yourself to keep you living longer, healthier, and be leaner? Do the same thing for your cat. If you, if you really care, do the same thing for your cat. Now there's a lot of different methods that you can do. You can, you, with, with um, we cook for our cats um, and uh, you know, you can do that. Um, uh, Ryan Lowry, um, Dr. Ryan Lowry, he's got a dog, Scoot. He feeds him a ketogenic diet. He feeds him a raw uh, ketogenic diet. Um, but you can also, they, they, they have in the store homemade um, recipes for cats now that are in the fridges now. And they have meal service, meal delivery services for your cat where they'll make that food, food homemade and send it to you. Now, am I saying you have to do this? No. And it, will your cat live a lo much longer, much healthier life and be leaner? Absolutely. Who or what are some of your favorite learning resources? So, wh who or what are my, some of my favorite learning resources? Listen, there are a variety, variety of ways that we've learned. Um, and uh, I say we, myself, Charlie, um, Fernando, um, you know, people I know who have really gotten a high level. And, okay, you can talk about your basics, okay? Let's say you're just starting out. You can talk about getting some basic textbooks like um, Essentials, Essentials of Strength and Conditioning um, and um, a basic anatomy book. You know, I think some Myriabs or whatever, um, anatomy and physiology. Those are your basics. But once you get past, and those are, ba and I mean basic, those are basic. You want to have, that's a basic language. Those are your basics. But the way that, we, like I said, we have mul multiple degrees, obviously, um, from multiple universities. And I will tell you, people who walked out with a BS degree or master's degree in exercise science or nutrition, if they just relied on the curriculum, um, they would know the basics. They would know really well essentials of strength conditioning and um, uh, that anatomy and physiology book. They'd be able to tell you that really well. How well would they be able to apply knowledge? Not very well. How cutting edge would they be? Not much at all. 
Um, how much would they be able to apply to themselves and others? Not much at all. So the way guys like Charlie and I learned is years and years and years and years and countless hours um, and losing sleep and not having a life um, and getting up at 4 a.m. and going to bed reading at 1 a.m. We would take topics, say, any question you gave us today, um, can deadlifts hurt you? We would take that question. There's not a textbook that's going to give that to you. You would take that question and we would go read 50 papers on it, okay? Um, I remember Charlie, his original dissertation idea was, do deadlifts make lats grow? So he showed me a literature review on it. And I tell you, he must have read 50 to 100 papers to come with that literature review. I remember for my master's thesis, um, I uh, went to the library and I was old school, I printed out papers. I came back with two duffel bags of papers because I was going back to the 1920s to look at information. They didn't have it like on the internet. So I had a bag of like papers from 1900s. So I was under, trying to understand the psychology of certain aspects. So I had to go back to old people, like, old school people like Thorndike and um, you know, Wood Woodworth and all these old school psychologists because I'm, in, I'm interested in the psychology of training. Anyway, that's how we learned. To do that, you're going to have to invest. To, to be an expert, you're going to need to probably spend 10,000 hours studying. <laughs> you know? um, and that's, that's not a nice answer, right? Um, most people don't want to do that. You're, you're going to scare people off with that. So that's why I go back to what the, probably the best resource and not being biased, I honestly think it is, in this field, for if you like the content we're talking about, join Charlie and I and Dr. Ryan Lowry and Fernando here um, with our Muscle PhD Academy. It's, again, join us for 30 weeks and team up with us and uh, learn. I think it's the best way. We've taken all those 10,000 hours of practice and put it into this academy, and we walk you through it step by step. We take you through every single body part. We talk about periodization. Charlie breaks down squat, deadlift, bench press. Sub imagine imagine how, being, when you go to school, you, I remember I was in school, I had to raise my hand to get an interesting question. Like I, I would be in biology and you know, they talk about you know, glycolysis and I was, I was an annoying student. Okay, I was the annoying student who, um, I was the annoying student who was asking the professor how that tied in with gaining muscle and they had no idea. And they were tired of me raising my hand. Guess what, when you're in our class and you raise your hand about how glycolysis can make you gain muscle or lose fat, we're the, we're the only probably professors, at least one out of a million who would actually take that question and answer that in depth, one-on-one. -on -one. And that's what we do with you. So again, I check out the musclephd.com and check out the Muscle PhD Academy. That's, that's my honest opinion. Yeah, and even if Muscle PhD Academy isn't in your bank account right now, we have all kinds of free articles, videos, lectures. Yep. I mean, there's so much free stuff on there. It, it, it's crazy. Take advantage of that for sure. Yeah, and exactly. So, like, we have our YouTube channel. Go to the YouTube channel. We have Charlie's written. Listen, you heard his. You heard what he said. This passion just on the deadlift. Go check out his articles because you're gonna see. Man, you're gonna see a great bridging between science and application. So even if you're like, eh, I'm not ready for the academy yet. Cool, go read the articles, man. You got a guy, this guy right here has spent his entire life trying to understand um, the highest level of uh, strength, muscle, power, athletic prowess. And he's, he's dedicated his life to it. Um, same thing with me, right? You know, and, you got an opportunity to go there for free of charge and read that information and it's there for you. I would, I would delve right into that information. Like if you go musclephd.com, read it, take an article. You could study one article for an entire month. Take as many notes as you can and go to the next one or one per week. Um, go to the videos on, on YouTube. That, that's what we give this information for you for. I think our last question of the day, ending on a bit of a somber yeah. Why do you think so many bodybuilders have died young in the past few years? So why do I think so many bodybuilders have died young in the past um, uh, years? Um, this is a 
listen, there's so many people that I grew up with that were heroes um, that I've seen pass away, friends that I've seen pass away. Um, I have a whole, I probably have a dozen people in my phone who I would consider friends. I'm not going to mention them, but like, I have, I don't take them out of my phone, but they're no longer with us. And many of them died in their 40s, 50s, early 60s, young men. Um, so let me say this. When you go back to old school bodybuilding, especially like in the 70s, a lot of times you'd have a bodybuilder and they would cycle. They would call it a cycle. And they would go on a, a stack of anabolics. Um, they have a testosterone as a base. They throw in a few extra ingredients. And then they train their asses off. Okay? But you had very light stacks, light stacks, by today's standards, nothing. You know? Maybe you might have something that's like double uh, TRT, you know, double testosterone replacement therapy and a few other anabolics, and they, they'd run it for a, a short period of time, a cycle, okay? So a couple weeks, two or three months, and they would cycle off and do post-cycle therapy. They would try and re retain as much muscle as they had. They'd do a... Pr proper post-cycle therapy, they'd recover, and they would do it again. I just saw uh, like something on um, Generation Iron, there was a bodybuilder who said, he goes, on, on, it was on their front page on their Instagram, he's, he's like, um, why I stay on trend year round? Okay, so I'm gonna explain something to you. Uh, if you stay on trend year round, there is a high probability I would put my money on it. If I was going to Vegas, I would put money on it. Unfortunately, you're going to die young. Period. So what's going on today is people stay on year-round. Now, what's driving them to stay year on year-round? Judging. Okay? It's, it's just what it is. Ju the judges are determining the winners are the largest, most massive human beings. And you don't have as much of a reward for the super lean, lean, symmetrical. It's okay to go on stage with a huge gut or in the 70s, that wasn't acceptable, right? Think about it, in the 70s, you could have Frank Zane beat Arnold Schwarzenegger and Frank Zane was nowhere near as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? You could have Serge Nubray defeat Lou Ferrigno, who was bigger? Obviously, Lou Ferrigno was the biggest bodybuilder who ever lived at the time, right? And so, um, you look at guys like Lee Labrada, right? Lee Labrada was a living work of art, aesthetically almost perfect, right? And so, um, and uh, I think again, Flex Wheeler, unfortunately, you know, he's having some issues right now, but he was the sultan of what? Symmetry. And so my point is that if the judging starts to reward more like the old school throwback or Sean Ray type physiques, um, uh, Flex Wheeler type physiques, or uh, let's go all the way old back, the 70s, the 80s. Maybe people would have an opportunity to cycle off, you know what I mean? But what I will say is that um, I understand it's a part of the sport, but it is not the sport, okay? So, you know, I think in the 70s and maybe even the 80s, I think. You use them as a tool, but you use them so I could train two hours in the morning and two hours at night and have a perfect diet. But even with that, you're not gonna be able to get as big as the guys that are on stage today, I understand that. So it's a combination of judging, and it's a combination of the fact that you can't do that. You can't stay on trend year round. You can't never cycle off. If you do not cycle off, understand there's a trade off. Charlie and I were talking about this the other day and basically, you know, there's an old school study. Um, this is probably in the 90s. Um, and they basically asked Olympic athletes. And they said, if you could take a drug to where you were guaranteed gold, but you would die in the next 10 years, and might even be you only have five years to live, would you take it? And it was over 50% of the people, might have been like 60, 70% of people said, I would take it. If you're on year round, you are that same person you are saying, I might die in the next five to 10 years, 
but this is my goal. And understand that is what you're doing. I'm not preaching to you. I'm not telling you should or shouldn't, but understand that that's what's happening. Now, let me say this. If that's your decision, it's your decision. I'm not lecturing you. You need to understand that you need to do everything you can to address health, just like you are addressing your lifting. That means cardio becomes very important. It means that just because you're taking mass doses of growth hormone, it does not mean it's acceptable to eat McDonald's all day because you're not gaining fat. That is good. That's completely unacceptable. You need to understand you need to address health just as much. You need intermittent fast. You need to take supplements like berberine. You need to take supplements for your liver. You need to do cardio and you need to treat yourself healthy. You need to focus on your sleep. Uh, um, uh, you need to focus on heart health and understand you need to project your career out properly. Understand that you need to go, okay, you know what? I'm doing this for three, five years. It's still probably is gonna shorten my life, but I need to understand that that's the, I'm going at it with this sprint. And after that, I'm going to have to come off. A great example of that from another sport, it's not has to do with steroids, was Barry Sanders. Barry Sanders, is one of the greatest, if not the greatest running backs, and certainly the, the, the greatest human highlight reel maybe in the history of sports. He was breaking records, he was crushing it for the Detroit Lions, but he understood that if I keep doing this and I keep taking hits, it is going to affect my life. And even though he was at the peak of his career, he stepped out and retired. And we miss him, we missed him from then on. You better think the same way if you're not coming off. Pull a Barry Sanders, go all out, but realize you need to make sure you factor that in and do it short and leave the sport, right? Or, or start to, to, to take another approach. So that, that's my advice to you. I think one more, to piggyback off that too, I think one more thing that happens is back in the day, in Arnold's day, bodybuilding it was a lifestyle for them. So they didn't have, there was no in season, off season for them. They stayed lean year round. Nowadays, guys at the top, they gain a little bit of weight. They're 300 pounds in the offseason. Yep. You know how hard it is for your heart to push blood through 300 pounds of tissue when you're five foot six. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You're, you're working your heart three times as hard as it has to. And most of these guys are dying of heart attacks, heart failure, things of these nature. Their blood pressure is 200 over 120. Yeah, yeah. Day, it's know? the truth. And it's, that's something, if you want bodybuilding to be a long-term venture for you and you want to dabble in the dark side of supplements, stay leaner. Don't let yourself get super out of shape because that's where you're really taking the toll on your organs. That's the stuff you can't see, you can't feel, but it's gonna come back to bite you in the end. That's a really good point Charlie makes. I think a good example is like Ben Pakulski, you know? Listen, if you are a bodybuilder and you step on the Mr. Olympia stage, I don't care what you say, what you say about an individual, you've made it to the top of your sport, okay? And he did that. I mean, he was one of the, he was as in good a shape and as lean as anyone I'd ever seen. And his conditioning was as good as the Tampa Lightning players. And we tested them both. Um, and so if you watch like the original like Generation Iron movie, you see Ben, he was in just phenomenal shape and he stayed lean year round. He didn't get to be huge and fat and sloppy and he always ate healthy. So, you know, here's a person who understood things and then what did Ben do? After staying lean and in the sport and training year round, he got out of it. You know what I mean? And switched to something different and to where now he's doing triathlons and stuff. I think that's pretty much it. That's all the questions we have today. Okay, so guys, thank you so much. Remember, we will see you next week at one. And then also remember, guys, that um, we'll be put, we're going to be filming after this a really cool video on effective reps. Stay tuned.